Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for coming, and thank you to the organisers of PHP Northwest for accepting my request. Sorry, Northeast. Sorry. I know, I know. But thank you for the organisers for accepting my request to come and talk to you tonight. My name's Stuart. I'm here to talk about event sourcing and what happens when it meets GDPR. And dongles. Come on, there we go. Right, I've been in the industry 25 years. I've worked in academia, I've worked in startups, I've worked in big enterprise including, including multinationals, and I've worked in government and related projects as well. And I've done most roles from CTO downwards during this last career. So I haven't seen everything by any means, but I have seen a lot. These days I run my own business, Gambara Digital. You can, the handle there at the bottom, you can follow us on Twitter if you want. You're very welcome to follow me on Twitter as well. However, please be warned, I'm passionate about my causes, I'm passionate about my hobbies, and I tweet a lot about both. So if you're the kind of person who only wants to see tech, you'd be happier following the company. Okay, so let's start with a show of hands. How many of you already use event sourcing? Nobody. Okay, I did not anticipate that. How many of you are thinking of adopting event sourcing at some point in the future? About four or five people, maybe? Okay, well, hopefully you're gonna find this talk then very helpful. And the last question, again, show of hands, how many of you already work in a regulated industry? Okay, quite a few. Hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll have convinced you that you all now work in a regulated industry. But we'll see. So the talk's divided into four sections. I'm gonna give you an introduction to what event sourcing is, or my understanding of it anyway. And then I'm gonna do the same for GDPR. We're then gonna spend some time looking at how the two interact with each other. And I've got some advice at the end for you to take away if you're thinking of adopting event sourcing. Now, please do ask questions as we go. There's a lot to get through, um, so I apologize if I'm going at quite a pace. Um, but questions, the more questions you ask, the more you'll get out of tonight, I promise. So let's start with event sourcing. Anyone wanna offer a, a description of what you think event sourcing is? Anybody? No? Nope. Okay. Primarily, it's a data architecture. And it's a data architecture where state changes are represented by something called an event. Now, all an event is, it's a record of something that has already happened. That's all an event is. It can be any structure you want, doesn't matter. And during the research for this talk, I went into the documentation of a popular event sourcing framework. And I've, I lifted some examples from it to show you what events could look like. If you imagine a, an e-commerce shopping cart, kind of thing many of us will have implemented during our careers. This is the kind of thing you'd use to describe it in events terms. Now what's going on architecturally? That's my interest as an architect, primarily. We've got an actor of some kind. They may be interacting with a user interface. It could be an app, could be a website, could be both. They may be interacting with an API. It doesn't really matter. Behind all of that, ultimately, is your business model and your data model. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been, I was taught to draw diagrams exactly that kind of structure back in the mid 90s. And I was taught by people who'd been doing it since the 70s. There's nothing new there so far. And if we extend that diagram to add the database, the database in a traditional system actually holds current state. Now with current state, you've taken your inputs, you've fed those in, into operations and out comes new states that you then save in the database. That's what current state is. So the database it's like keeping a running score of your current results, but it doesn't know, it doesn't keep your workings out. It doesn't know how you got there. So architecturally, you just have that. And depending on how you deploy it, that is sometimes described as a three-tier architecture. Okay, so there's, there's nothing magical there at all. Now this is where event sourcing comes in and where it's different. You're not storing state in the database with event sourcing you store the events themselves. So again, architecturally, 
we're interacting with something known as an event store. Two words. Event store, one word, I believe, is a registered trademark. So it's two words. Now, here's the thing. Because you're not storing current state anywhere, you've got to build it when you want it. You've got to calculate it. And that's a process called playback, which you'll find various frameworks talk about. And again, architecturally, we've got our business model and our data model, and they're primarily concerned with two activities. You've got event validation. It's looking at incoming events to preserve the integrity of the event store. And then you've got event playback, which is calculating current state for whatever sat in front of it to interact with your actors. That's quite a bit different to certainly how I've built systems for 25 years. I imagine it's quite different to how you currently build systems. Yeah, you say so? So when I ask people who are advocates of event sourcing, why do this? What's the point of it? Normally somewhere in the argument is a statement similar to this. Because you've got a whole history of how you got to where you are, you can go back in time. You've effectively created a time machine in theory. Thing is though, does that hold up to scrutiny? We're gonna come back to that throughout this talk. That guarantee is the whole point of doing event sourcing, but does it actually work? I wanna fo keep focused on the event store for the moment. See, architecturally, our event store has replaced a database in our architecture. We used to have a database there, and now we've got an event store instead. But you see, it's still a database. It doesn't matter whether it's being sat on top of MySQL or Postgres, if it's sat on top of some sort of NoSQL data store, or even something that's specially written for um, event sourcing. It doesn't matter. It's ultimately still a database. It's ultimately still dealing with persisting data and retrieving data based on queries. You can't get around that. There's no magic can get around that. And the reason I mention that is because the event store, therefore, is subject to all the constraints any other database system ever invented are. Things like the amount of available IOPS in production. It's amazing how many people overlook that one. Then, you know, in a production system, you'd normally stick your database on a different server. So that means you've got a network involved and you've got constraints that the network imposes. No database server scales linearly. The more work you're doing at once, the more performance is affected. And event stores have the same problem. And because you're dealing with persistent data, your event store is your primary database at the end of the day. That means you've got all the maintenance operations of backups and restores to deal with, and also things like schema changes, ultimately. Now, the folks who are advocates for event sourcing went, well, there is actually a kind of database out there that sort of suits our way of working and minimizes a lot of those performance problems. And they're known as append-only databases or log databases. So it's quite common to see event sourcing packaged with one of these as the event store. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, these kind of databases are immutable. Once data's in, it's in there forever. You can't get it back out, and you can't edit the data that's in there. And given we're talking about GDPR, that's a topic we're going to come back to several times throughout the night. Now, what I've been describing so far, you could call a pure event sourcing system. If you imagine, when you're working with databases, I mean, you're pulling back current state and you're already finding the database is often a bottleneck, aren't you, in your code? So imagine you're trying to pull back a whole history of events to compute the current state instead. That's an even bigger bottleneck. So in reality, on, on real systems, event playback is just too slow to use all the time. And that's where something called ESCQRS comes in. Anyone heard of that? Nope. One or two nods. CQRS itself, let's deal with CQRS first. It stands for Command Query Responsibility Separation, or segregation if you prefer. I've seen it written both ways, okay? Now I mentioned that event sourcing is a data architecture. 
CQRS actually started out as a code architecture, nothing to do with data by itself. This is where it came from. And the idea is your code is separated out. Your read operations are, is a distinct path of code to your write operations. And by distinct path of code, ultimately we're talking about separate business models, not necessarily separate data models. And here's a diagram taken from Martin Fowler's website. You all know of Martin Fowler? Okay. If you don't and you're involved in any sort of software design, martinfowler.com is a resource you need to bookmark. He's been writing about software architectures and patterns, Christ, how many years now? I think it goes back to at least 2000. It's a very, very influential website. But here's a diagram I've taken directly from Martin's site showing where CQRS came from. Apologies about the purple, that's his diagram, not mine, I promise. Now, the thing is with CQRS is it can also be a data architecture, which is where it gets a bit more interesting. Um, if you've got separate paths through the code, it's very easy to make your read operations read from one database, but your writes go into a different one. And I'm sure some of you have actually split up your database to help scale things in the past. Yeah, that's a very common trick. That doesn't make it a data architecture. What makes it a data architecture is if those databases start to have different schemas. You're storing completely different data in those databases. You're optimizing one database for reads. How many of you have done um, like reports and stuff against databases? Yeah. So those of you who are nodding, you've probably ended up running reports against databases optimized for that in order to get them through as your, as your um, systems have scaled. Similar idea, but the actual app itself running off that. And it's that data architecture where the event sourcing crowd get interested. And indeed, that's what ESCQRS is. Because not only is event sourcing a data architecture, so is ESCQRS. It's also a data architecture. And it's designed to solve this problem. A pure system, playing back the events takes too long. So you've got a website that's slow. And what, what, what are one of the tricks you use to speed it up? You cache the pages, don't you? You start to build caches in. Well, in ESCQRS, conceptually, what you're doing is caching current state as you go along, so you don't have to recalculate it all the time. So architecturally, instead of our event store on its own, what's happened now is we're still writing to the event store, and then the event playback is writing, is calculating the current state, and writing to something known as a projection cache. And then it means when you're serving read requests out, you're effectively, and again, this is all conceptual, but there's a lot of devil in the detail that I'm skipping over, but conceptually, you're effectively doing cache lookups from the projection cache in order to get the current state. So you no longer have to calculate it. So I mentioned earlier about this guarantee of about being able to always calculate state by playing back these events. That is important when it comes to the projection cache. It's called a cache because you may choose to back it up and restore it for um, pragmatic sake. But ultimately, if it's lost for any reason, or you've got a cache that only holds re uh, most recently used items, you can b rebuild anything in there by just playing back events again. That's why it's a cache and not a primary data store. Very important property, that. So architecturally, if we lose our projection cache, for any reason, it can be recreated. It may not be convenient to uh, recreate it if it goes down at like 9 a.m. on the morning and you've got a busy day, but technically it's supposed to be possible. However, the reason I'm mentioning this is ultimately you've got code doing these calculations to work out what the current state is before it's saved in the projection cache. And that code changes over time. If you deploy an event sourcing system today, that code in two years' time will be different. You'll have fixed bugs. Some of the logic will have changed as your, um, the business or organization evolves. It's inevitable. Yeah. Code isn't static at the end of the day. And in this case, what, I, what I'm talking about here is the event playback code that's doing these projection calculations. 
it changes over time. And that's going to be something that's important when we look at GDPR. So this guarantee is starting to look a bit iffy already, OK? Because you need to, if you want to absolutely recreate state at any point in time, you need to use the code that existed for that point in time. And doing my research, I didn't come across any event sourcing frameworks that spoke about this problem and how they solve it. So if you want to go back a week or a month or a year and say, this is the data that existed at that point, but you're using today's code, you may get a different result than what you had a year ago. Now, the event sourcing people have actually thought of this. And they've got a concept of a snapshot. So instead of the projection cache just being something like memcache, you write stuff in and it just carries on forever. They've introduced this concept of snapshots where you can say, here's the projection cache at this moment in time. So you don't start back from the beginning when you're running your calculations. They are projections at a point in time. And that's something else that's going to become very important when we look at how this impacts GDPR. So that's event sourcing. And just very quickly to sum all that up, an ESCQRS system, you've not got any current state in it. You are storing events as the primary source of data. State is built by a process that conceptually is known as playback. It's inevitable that some of these events will hold personal data. Personal data is the classic type of data that GDPR is concerned about. And we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. So in an ESCQRS system, you've got personal data potentially in three different places at any moment in time. It will be in the event store if you're handling personal data at all. It is probably in the projection cache if that data has been used. And therefore, it is probably in a snapshot somewhere. So remember those three. We're going to be coming back to looking at, that, at how that affects GDPR in a moment. Event stores may be immutable. Once you've written data to an event store, there may not be a mechanism for you to change that data or even delete it. Projection cache is built by code that changes over time. So if you're rerunning calculations, you may get different results on different days. And we've got snapshots to help us with that to say, at this moment in time, here's the projections that we knew about. So that's event sourcing is a very, very quick conceptual overview. Now, those of you who have been looking at event sourcing at all, how does that fit with your own understanding? Any surprises in there? Any differences? Nope. OK, well, that's good. So let's start looking at GDPR. <clears throat> 